Hey everyone, just a quick production note that this episode is a bit different in that it's the first of my master series that I'm trying to produce where we bring in subject matter experts that are proficient in a specific skill set. Today we start with Azork, who of course you know from his digital photography and editing. And then uh, I plan to bring on the modders, the decalers, the hand painters, the 3D modelers. There's literally no end to what people kind of folks are out there that can bring some value to this podcast. So that being said, this episode did run a little long for that. I apologize for those who like shorter episodes and we were having some technical issues, which has forced my hand into moving to a new recording platform that you'll experience with my next episode. It will greatly reduce my production time and editing burdens so that I can start getting episodes pumped out faster and produce much that much more quickly. So I appreciate your patience as we uh, go through this one. Also, this is a audio podcast about a visual medium. And for that, it is difficult to talk about things when you guys aren't there next to us, looking over our shoulders, seeing what we're seeing. So please bear with us as we do talk about some posts on Instagram that you may or may not be familiar with. I encourage you to visit all the artists that we mention because we do give some shout outs as well as taking your own time to poke around the individual guests and co-host uh, Instagram sites, because there are a lot of great works out there that don't get enough attention. All right, that's it. Let's, uh, let's get this party started. Take care. Bring me the next. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Big Fat Big Cast. I'm your host, Brett, aka Geeko40. We talk about any and all things related to the premium custom minifigure world. And today I'm joined by Marcus, also known as Marks Bricks on Instagram. And hey guys. Special co- <laughs> Woohoo! And I, and, I special- to clap. <laughs> and he's going to be a clap in the back. Ryan, I haven't introduced you yet. <laughs> <laughs> and a special co host we brought back, Adam, creator, owner, and designer of Phoenix Customs. Hey, hey guys. guys. <laughs> So, Whoa. Adam, I imagine this must be weird because you're not here to answer questions. No, I get to be a fan, which is amazing. I love it. <laughs> I don't know if people know this, but like half the reason I use Instagram is so I can see Lego photography. So this is this is my jam. <laughs> uh, for those who do want to hear uh, me put Adam in the hot seat, you can go back to episode three. We did an in-depth interview. We asked him a lot of hard questions about some of the things going on in the industry and going on with his own brand and his uh, collab partners as well. Uh, moving on, if you follow myself or Marcus, you know that beyond just collecting minifigs, we also like to showcase them, uh, or I should say elevate them further by ways of applying expert lighting, editing techniques, uh, to present them in stylized portraits, or some com- some cases, complex scenes, using all sorts of you know special effects. Uh, today's guest is no different. He's been around for a number of years. He has cemented himself as arguably one of the most talented custom fig photographers out there specifically in regards to recreating scenes from movies while swapping out the actors with actual minifigs. The BBC is proud to welcome Sam, but you may know him as Azork. Say hi, buddy. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. It's uh, it's an honor to be there and speaking to my online friends for the for the first time. And this is and, truly uh, an international yeah. episode. Yeah, it is. We have Marcus from Taiwan, you guys from the U.S., and me from France. Right. And now and now every time I read a DM from you, I'm gonna hear this voice. <laughs> <laughs> well yep. voice reveal as well, because I believe no one knows how I sound. It, it's not a big deal that voice reveal. It it throws people off at first, but you get used to yeah, it. Yeah, it does. So this is gonna be a very casual episode compared to most. Um I have a very loose script because this is what I'm, this is the first of what I'm gonna be dubbing the master series. It's basically where I pull in folks who have demonstrated and are widely accepted as a master of a particular skill or trade and discuss the nuances therein. Uh, beyond, uh, right now, we're today we're talking about digital photography and editing. In the future, I plan on bringing on some expert decalers, uh, handmade folks and sculptors, 3D printers and whatnot. And it'll be given a chance to pick our brains uh, and talk in regards to that kind of stuff. Uh, I did not solicit questions from the audience for this one because I had too many of my own. I didn't want this to go too long. However, I think we'll probably hit 
90% of what people are wondering anyway. And I kind of want to get beyond the uh, what's your favorite minifig. So that being said, uh, Sam, if you could just go, I want, I want to keep this somewhat traditional. And if you could just tell us more about yourself, your username, which I've never pronounced until I started this podcast <laughs> and still throws me off and how you got into customs. So my name is Sam, in case you guys didn't know yet. And basically, well, if I had to introduce myself as a person, I'm currently a student and one of my main hobbies is collecting figures and photography. So let's start with the, with the username because the story behind it is really weird. Like, first of all, I always loved um, sharing my, my passions online and it started really early with uh, Pokemon cards. And I used to do like Pokemon card reviews on YouTube. And there was that, that, that Pokemon that I forgot the name of who had like the, the same letters as my name in his name. And when I started on Instagram, I first started with the same Pokemon name, but then a friend of mine just mixed the, the letters together and came came up with Azort, which is extremely random, but I still kept it because what I like about it is that it can be anything. Like Azort can be a Lego photographer. If I tomorrow want to do politics on my account, I can still do it under Azort. Like I'm not limited with that name because it can mean anything. So this is why I keep it. And this is how I I figured it out. But yeah, it's extremely weird. I myself didn't even know how to pronounce it before you pronounced it for me in English, <laughs> at least. But yeah, it's it's a weird name, but I like it. I really like it. So, how long have you been collecting, and how did you get into collecting? So, I've been actively only collecting since uh, like COVID, like when I started collecting a lot and uh, regularly. But I've been exposed to the, to the custom world for, uh, for a while. Like I was on Flickr back in like 2014, 2015. And I used to see pictures of customs and I even saw, um, the review MGF did with Adam's figs, the, the very first version of, uh, the stealth suit and, uh, the amazing Spider-Man 2 figure. And I was so amazed by those figs because Lego didn't make them and I had no idea what, where they were from. And like for a few years, I, I didn't try looking for them, but when I finally came on Instagram, which was in late 2015, but I didn't make content yet. I discovered like where those figs came from. The first reseller I, I knew of was uh, Andrew from the UK. And like in early 2016, I got my very first, uh, custom figure, which was the, I don't even remember what it was, but it was a UV printed figure. It was a superhero one. I need to find it again, but I believe it was a flash figure because I was looking for those online sale and, uh, flash figs. Mm -hmm. It was a CW one, but it wasn't online sale. I don't remember the brand. And then like, it was my only first custom fig. And then I, uh, I kind of started collecting, but like once a month. And then when, uh, when I got my own money, I started collecting more regularly and buying more fat stuff. And now I am where I am bankrupt and uh, <laughs> with no money and a lot of things. But you got some pretty pictures to show for it. Yeah, hopefully. Well, Thank God I at least do something with them because if it wasn't for the pigs, I'd just buy them and put them on display and never touch them again. So I am glad that I kind of, kind of have fun with them with the, with my pigs. Me too. I mean, it really brings, uh, to be honest, I mean, it's such a, a thing that's above just putting it on the shelf. Like you said, it, it brings these things to life, which I think is kind of half the fun of having these, you know, instead of just staring at them every so often, it's kind of cool to put them in an action pose or put them with some, some other things going on. So I think it's really cool what you do with that. And Thanks, likewise, I appreciate, I appreciate you, Adam, affording us the opportunity to pose them because I remember during our interview last, you mentioned you consider these things when actually designing them, you just think about posability and display and how we can work with them for photography. Yep. 
I do. Um, more than people think, I think. Uh, and that's actually one of my questions I was going to have for later on after uh, uh, you kind of discuss all these other things. But yeah, that's something that I'm always curious about is what do you guys as photographers look for for these kind of figures? And I kind of have some ideas, but yeah, it's uh, it helps talking with you guys about that stuff and get feedback from you guys about what's working, what sticks with a figure, how you can't pose it because of such and such. I do think of that quite a bit when I put these designs together with uh my 3d artists and and the production teams so it's and i'm sure some other brands do too but it's it's very important i think especially um you know just to be able to express these figs when you get them and do something with them you know it's it's part of the reason why lego figures are so fun is you can do things with them so yeah um it's hard to make a fig that's so static and it, it even frustrates me if i get one and i'm like ah because of these elements i can't do the things i'd like it to do like I'm sure you guys would when you're looking at it with, through a photography lens, so or a camera lens. So, having worked with like many figures, Adam's figs are like the best to shoot with because you can actually move them. Like there are figs that you cannot even lift their arms up or do anything because either it's the printing or the molded part that's gonna break, and it's so frustrating. But Adam's figs are are a pleasure to shoot with because they're so easy to 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 have fun with basically i've uh i've had challenges in the past where i've had to scrap shots because i really wanted to turn the figure's head but the hair wouldn't allow it because it was like a it was like a you know a female hero or villain yeah and that was that was really disappointing i was like well i'll just photoshop it the hair on later i'll just do a i'll shoot a separate a clean plate and then a, another plate and then just you know, Photoshop, but I was like, oh, it's so much work. Why, why? But yeah, in the exactly. end, you know, I honestly wound up creating something that I think worked even better than what I was hoping for. So while I do love the flexibility, sometimes those restraints could help push me to come up with more creative solutions on how to fix these things. That's really yeah, an that's interesting true. point. You know, it's kind of like the uh, the Spielberg and Jaws thing. You know, it wouldn't have been half as good without that shark failing. So it's kind of an interesting point I never considered. Yeah, it's it's really. Um, I mean, no, I agree though. There are some that like I don't want to take apart. I don't want to pop out an arm. I don't want to put sticky tack on that print. And you get worried about these types of things, but in the end, you gotta you gotta kind of. Like, I don't know if, um, if anyone's seen the, the one, remember from the old Spider Man one I did of the, uh, Iron Spider I did for the LCM fig. Yeah. Uh, just if you look at the behind the scenes crazy. on that, there's like, there's like a pound of sticky tack on the, the back. Sticky tack all over the oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I remember. Oh my God. And the I'm head trying, is I'm... like, the head's like three, three, three centimeters ahead of the entire fig. So I can get that, you know, that lowered head, sunken, high shoulder look. It, it's really, I would say for the most of my work, and I can't speak to, to the other gentleman here, but most of my work can be summarized like that Sim Simpsons meme where Homer looks all buff in his underwear, but behind <laughs> him, they show the picture behind him and it's all his fat put together with clothespins and shit. It's exactly <laughs> the same on my side. Like, I think it's the same that we were. I don't think people realize that they get, they, they think, oh, that looks so good. I'm like, man, you don't know how bad this looks in reality. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny whenever I get these, uh, these pictures of like, you know, the, you know, sometimes you guys will send me like an early shot or something and I'll see something and it'll just make me so nervous. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I hope that arm goes in. Okay. After you're done. Or I hope that leg goes back the way it was supposed to, you know, like I get so nervous as the, uh, the career, cause I can't even do that to my own figs. I'm sure you guys must be sweating bullets every time you, you take them apart to make those cool poses. Well, it's funny that you say that because the first reason that I started like taking apart custom figs is because I told myself that, you know, they may be taking them apart so much during the, the production process that if I do it another time, it would be okay. But I guess it, it's not actually in the end. Marcus, how many figs have you had accidents with? Oh, so many. It's like, um, I have to prepare a, a cushion <laughs> or something to avoid uh, figs from falling because um, my, my process is so long. Every session is about um, two to three hours. So um, I don't take a lot of shots, but um, 
it did take a, a while to get a shot done. And then um, the reason for that is that um, I shot with, um, I looked through my camera and I tried different angles, um, different perspectives, and uh, I moved the lights around. And every time I try to uh, move the lights, because um, I'm lazy, I always get the angles and the pers perspective I want. And then I move the lights to see um, how the lights place off with the fades and how the does it look good through my lens. And then um, when I move the lights around, I sometimes I accidentally hit um, the stand. And the stand falls and the thick fall, and sometimes uh, <laughs> it resolved in damages. I can tell you how I cannot tell you how many times that I did that, and every time uh, the stand falls and I'm like I, I'm having a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, I'm so <laughs> glad my office is carpeted. So real quick, starting with uh, equipment. Personally, for the longest time, I was shooting with just my phone. I was using a Google Pixel 4a 5G, which it's been about three years, and I still have the same phone. I need to upgrade. But I've since moved on to my wife's. My wife bought a camera when she was contracted to be in Alaska, and she hasn't asked for it back. So uh, now I've got a Canon. Yeah, so sometimes I still go back to my phone. I actually, thanks to soon saw Chicken Brick. He showed me a um, cool attachment that I got from my phone that allows me to do widescreen and macro, mm -hmm. um, which I've used in the past. However, um, if I were to upgrade my Pixel phone to the newest version, it has a the Pro version does have a built-in macro lens, so that would be nice. It's probably a lot better than you know, just clipping on something. Um, Sam, what what do you use for your photography? Mainly, uh, I use my phone, which changed uh, time to time but like currently i'm on the iphone 12 pro and sometime i do use a camera it's a canon as well but i really like using a phone because it allows me so much freedom in, in movement like i can pose my figs move my phone like wherever i want so yeah like 70 80 percent of the time i'm on my phone and then sometimes the camera but the camera is mostly for experiments. I'm not so uh, at ease with it currently. And Marcus, you're probably the most pro person in this group chat right now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I I, uh, I wouldn't say pro, but um, I started off with the uh, with an uh, iPhone six, and then three months later, I got tired of it, and I got eleven pro, and then. I would say uh, in a year or two, I, uh, I bought a, a secondhand camera from off my friend for like a hundred bucks. It wasn't really old model, but it works. And then three months in, I got a micro lens. And then this year, my wife, actually in May, my wife got me an uh, Alpha 6400. And I've been I've been shooting with camera for around two years now, maybe a two and a half years. You've probably shown more growth than any of us uh, yeah. in such a short span of time. It's insane. Oh, really? Uh, oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, wow. I mean, we've all grown, but but if we had to go by you know length of growth, I mean, or amount of growth in a certain this amount of time, you have definitely take the cake, man. Uh, I. Uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> really, it's a big comp compliment. Um, I do, I do struggle with growth sometimes. I, I'm sure Brett, you know this because I've uh, I came to you so many times about you know motivation, frustration, and all that. Um, I wouldn't you, say you get paralyzed by perfection. Yeah, I say it straight up, you get paralyzed <laughs> by perfection, in that you're always looking to me. Yeah, uh, so. In, in our inner circle, we have a joke where we call, um, when we talk about finding flaws in a, in a, in a product, uh, we call it Marcus Vision. <laughs> because it's like he's walking, and then every time I type it in a DM or group chat, I always write Marcus Vision with a little trademark emoji. And the, re the reason being is he always, 
like I'll send him a render of a new brand's fit. He's like, logins off. I'm like, what are you talking about? And then he like said, then he like zooms in. It's like, look right here. I'm like, how did you even spot that? I wouldn't even notice <laughs> that in hand. So you have a very good eye for detail, but almost to your detriment. It's it's great because it helps recognize when there's great stuff accomplished, but also mm-hmm. when um, there's a concern. Uh, I think you sometimes get hyper focused, and especially and now that you've you've um, you've made good friends with the folks like Mr. Lee, who's an amazing action figure photographer. You know, I mean, I can see his influence on your work. It's just like you surround yourself with so many pros that you're trying to learn from that you're like not holding you're holding yourself to their standard. And you really need to just focus on your standard. I was going to say, actually, as an outsider looking in for you guys, the three of you guys, you've all improved so much over the years. But I think the more you guys have come along, I, I can see you guys nitpicking so many things about some great shots that you guys sometimes send me. I'm just like, you know, Sam sent me some. I'm just like, why didn't you post that? That looked amazing. <laughs> and then he's like, well, there's I just don't feel it. You know, I'm like, what? You're missing this amazing photo that could be getting praised online and blah, blah, blah. I'll tell you why. Because if there's this one little thing that we don't like about it, it'll haunt our dreams for ages. Yeah, exactly. I think mm-hmm. I, I bet. we've all been there where we posted something and it's been like an hour or two. Like I also have a joke where I don't usually like or share anything Marcus posts until it's been up for at least an hour. Because <laughs> he always takes it back down, he fixes it and then reposts it or whatever. But um, <laughs> if I if I do something like I can tell you right now, there's a picture I did. Of, of Adam, of your Bully Maguire, your your you know, Spider-Man 3, Black Symbiote suit. And yeah. there's this little tiny dot glare of, of light on the top of his head. That to this day, I'm still like, oh, I need to make him do a new <laughs> shot because that thing sucks. And it's a really good shot. It's one of the first times I experimented with color lighting. Mm-hmm. And I was really happy with it. But that one little dot, I'm like, I should have just clone stamped that thing out. But the funny thing is, so I think that's what comes with like the more you do something and become more of an expert in in a field like like this Lego photography. But I think it's kind of cool to kind of see those. I mean, obviously, you guys get driven nuts by them because it's your your babies that you spend so much time on. But at the same time, it's kind of cool to see those growth things on a photography page. You know, even, you know, someone that's uh, as eagle eyed on something like that as you guys can be. I think it's kind of cool that you can look back and go like, that was me as, you know, when I was starting to learn the lighting, blah, 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 editing. And then nowadays, you know, where you're at, it, it kind of shows that growth, you know, that you were, you know, you can look back at some of your old, you know, what you would call failings that some of us that aren't as eagle eyed don't see. But yeah, I just think it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, part of it though. I mean, it'd be cool that, I mean, nowadays it's harder to get those, if you can see that little bit of things that you're not quite happy with, but it's still kind of interesting as an outsider to see that growth on your page. You know what I mean? Well, mm-hmm. there was, um, there's so a good example of when we're, we're stuck creatively and we don't know what to shoot. One of the things that I try to do, I know Marcus has done also is we'll go through and look at those old, um, posts that we've done that were like, Oh, we could have done that better and then try to redo it. So mm-hmm. I think my most recent example is the, um, Thor Ragnarok arena scenes. You know, the first one I did was, it was cute. It was okay. But then doing it again, like two years later, I made it look like it came right out of the movie. It's so good. Yeah, the second one was amazing. It's still one of my favorites to this day. I, I always am tempted to repost, you know, one of my favorites of each one of you guys. And this is the one that I'm always like, should I repost this one again and just say, gosh, this is so good. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's fantastic. Well, we'll take the, we'll take the advertisement, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I think for me, um, I used to do um, taking out posts a lot because I, like Brett said, I'm I'm always chasing for per- perfection. But now I'm getting more and more comfortable with myself and with my my shots. So I don't I I don't think I do that anymore. But obviously, uh, <laughs> Brett still chooses to. Uh, wait for an hour after posting <laughs> but um i would say i'm i'm sort of a pixel paper pixel peeper that's what a lot of photographers says because they look so into the details they look they examine every pixel of their shot and i'm like that and i'm i guess the reason that um I'm, i took so long with each session is that I, I always chase that, you know, 
the perfection that what I want in my shots. So I don't know. Well, the results are always good. <laughs> yeah, thanks. There's never been a shot where I'm like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I may, I have one issue with your content, Marcus. Is that, yeah. you know, whenever I used to post a pic and the quality was a bit bad, I mm-hmm. used to blame Instagram and say that they killed the quality, but you showed you showed us that it's not an an excuse, because man, whenever I I see your post even on Instagram, I zoom in, it, the quality is so good. I Thanks. really don't know Thank how you. to do it, man. Yeah, I've taken to well, just so Sam. So just what I do is when I um when I create my canvas in Photoshop. Oh no, so so basically, they want a 1080 by 1080. At like 72 pixels per inch, I do 2160, 2160 by 150. So mm-hmm. I double the resolution and I double the amount of um, the pixel density. Oh, okay. This way, I just, I'm just overcompensating for any kind of Instagram compression that happens. So um, cameras can only do so much. Lights always help, of course. I mean, Marcus, again, you probably own more lights than any of us here. <laughs> I've kind of followed in your footsteps, so mm-hmm. I'll go first. I usually originally had these LED panels that had these colored gels that you could swap out. They tend to run hot, and then the gel started warping. And then I only had so many colors, so I'd have to start like putting in like a yellow and a red gel to get orange, or a blue and a green to get purple, and um, I mean a blue and a red to get purple, and. Um, it just wasn't working out for me. And then eventually I found that one light kit that um, was the, the little mini tripods. It was like three, three lights. Small and they came rigs. With, yeah, the small, the, yeah, the small rigs. And they were very affordable. And they came with, um, and you know, I'll, I'll link to all these light kits we're talking about. I'll link to them in the show notes. So you guys know what we're talking about. You can make your own decisions. Um, came in a cool carrying case. Each one had a diffuser that you could put onto the little thing. It had a little... Uh, a little clip on, which again, a bunch of little gels that you could put into the frame, which then clips onto the cube light itself. And uh, almost, I would say, form factor is kind of like a loom cube. And then again, little tripods, you can, you know, make them taller, smaller, you can rotate, tilt, whatever. And then lastly, I finally got into Yulanzi lights, which are LEDs that allow me to shoot on a white spectrum of warm to hot but then also just do every RGB color possible. So no more swapping out gels or any of that kind of crap. I can adjust hue, saturation, and brightness on all of them. And they are magnetic on both sides, so you can stack them very easily. They've got a magnetic strip on the back, so you can stick them to something else if you want. And I freaking love these things. And they hold a charge holds forever, it feels like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All that being said... Marcus, you're going to go last because I know you have more than anybody. Sam, <laughs> Sam which, what, what lights are you currently working with? And I imagine you have a bit of a different challenge because you're always constantly uh, working to match lighting conditions of cinematic scenes and moments. So yeah. you're probably a little more restricted in what you're trying to do. I'm just curious how you do it. So mainly I use uh, two big soft boxes, one on the right and on the le- on the left, that lights up my whole desk. And then I sh- I try to like imagine there is a shot where uh, uh, the character's right side is brighter brighter than the than the left one. I roughly try to get this effect like when I shoot, and then I do the rest like when it comes to the color or intensifying the lighting like on the right i do it mainly via editing because i i have i still have a lot of trouble mastering lighting because you know we talked about it a few months ago and i also got those yulanzi lights that marcus and you use and i'm having a bit of a hard time having the the effect i want with them so i still do it uh, through editing mainly and have those soft boxes that help me just light up the thing. Well, you've got, you've got, um, I'm not going to call it an advantage, but you've got reference material and that yeah. you're looking at a cinematic scene. So you can see like a wall, you know, this light is overhead or the sun was to the character's left. So you can kind of plan around that. Um, yeah, it, what, what's your biggest 
pain point with the Alonzi fit lights exactly? Is it just the direction or the intensity or it's, what? Well, honestly, it's uh, the fact that it wasn't as easy as I thought thought it would be. Like, you know, uh, seeing what you see with your eyes and what you see through your phone or your camera is two total, totally different things. And it's actually matching what you want to see and what you see with your eyes to the camera, actually. That's, I would say, my biggest uh, so far issue. But I'm still working on it and trying to get, uh, trying to improve. But it's, it's, uh, it's not as, as easy as I expected. Well, one thing that Marcus and I do, and I got this idea from Marcus, actually, and it's, it's so damn obvious, but I never thought of it until he told me, is, like you said earlier, don't use your eyes. Use the viewfinder. Yeah, that's... You know? Just, That's just true, actually, which just I never get, did actually get get your framing right, your composition right, and then use your viewfinder and see where the lights move. Because oh, I got the great rim light on the on the left side here. Then I go to the camera and it's not there. Well, just instead of playing the guessing game and running back and forth, back and forth, just look through the viewfinder and then move the light around until you see what you're trying to see. You know when I uh, when I used to practice, I also used to uh, watch Marcus's account a lot. Like I was like, how does he do that? Marcus, is, I would say, is maybe one of, if not the person that masters light light the best in the in the custom community. And yeah, honestly, man. It's 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 really art, man. Like it's insane. Uh, I said yeah. before, Marcus, you're probably the most technical. Really advanced. I mean, now I'm not gonna. I don't want to dismiss like Brick Cinema, Nick. You know, he's like this. Is, he does this for a living. <laughs> but for as a casual, for the, from the casuals like us, Marcus, you are definitely the probably the most, you know, technical photographer in the Lego custom community. Yeah. Oh man, um, I'm getting uh, compliments left and right. This is. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting a, a little bit, you know, shy. Right now. Yeah, I'm looking at these. Bat- I got I got everyone's account up right now. I'm looking at these damn Batman shots, and it's just like <laughs> it's all straight mood in all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, each I've been looking at every one of you guys' uh, pages as you guys have been talking, just to kind of get a a sense of what you're talking about with each one of these shots. Uh, but yeah, when I looked at Marcus's, I'm just like, especially these Batman ones. I mean, look at the just, one where with the Batman. The right. It's the cape facing you. He's just a, it's like a back picture, and he's looking off to the right. It's actually mm-hmm. a oh. fig, Adam. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that uh, where it's just uh yeah from the back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's just... <laughs> so clean. So um so uh, I don't know which I I would talk first, but so I'll, I'll talk about my gears. Currently, I'm u- I'm using eleven lights. I uh, yeah, eleven lights. I have three from the small rig package. And I have uh, six from Yolanzi. Four of them are um, stick. Those ones that you bought, those stick ones. Mm-hmm. And um, I have three four that are panels, and one with uh, it's a kind of circ circ. Um, it's a round one. I don't know how to explain it. Whatever. <laughs> I, I think for me, um, I don't have the skills that Brett and Sam has, uh, which is editing, because I I do do editing, but it's very minimal. I o- only correct um, flaws and issues with my shots, like dust or um, fibers, that sort of things. I do um, some lighting effects here and there, but that's not my strong suit. So uh, I I think I've been influenced by Mr. Lee a lot. Um, I got all my inspiration from him, from him early on, and I've been working. I I think excuse I'm, me, one more mark. Just for those wondering, it's Mr. Lee L E E E four E's. Yeah, four E's. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I actually uh, admires uh, Mr. Lee. Because I think he he is probably one of the uh, the best photographer in terms of um, portraits and lighting work. So I've been honing my skills on lighting because I know 
I don't have the time to learn editing skills, but I do have the time to um, to master uh, the light work. Uh, I do thank you guys for the compliments, but I th I still think that I'm not there yet. <laughs> but um, I try the best I can. No, I mean I'm not. We're not saying that you're, you've reached perfection. I mean, there's always room for improvement. Mm -hmm. But we were just saying, you know, give yourself a little flexibility. Don't go too hard on yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's one of my biggest problem is that because um, I, I do. I'm, I'm sure. sorry. I'm sorry. I got to interrupt again. <laughs> I'm looking at your Logan, your Jin Logan uh -huh. photo, and the damn light you got on this guy's hair is just insane. Yeah. You well, hear every single wave increase in the mold. It's insane. Yeah. Um, that's one of the purpose that I, uh, uh, that's one of the goals I set out for this shot. And the other one is to um, have those uh, glares on the claws. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I did that because I think one of the uh, most element, uh, most important element about Logan is that his claws, right? And what you see it in the movies, um, the claws are always uh, shiny, but the silver paint aren't shiny. It's not metal. So how to make it, you know, be a focus point of the shot is um, what I aim, what I set out to do. So I um, I do a lot of you know lighting man manipulation, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, mission accomplished. Thanks. That yeah. actually got me thinking so too. Uh, for all three of you guys, do you guys when you go into a shot, do you have uh, things that you're focusing on, like a thing you want to accomplish, either with lighting or how it's uh, how the figure is um, manipulated or how set the setup is, or what's do you guys have that ahead of time, or do you kind of see what comes of it once you get to the scene and you start moving it around like what what do you guys do i usually have a vision in my head of what i've, I've already framed it in my head how i want it to look um some folks i know like say like keith castle in the pool he likes to draw his stuff out and he usually matches it really well i personally i'm um, just i just visualize it in my head and i do my best and then but I don't get married to the subject. I try to keep it open so that if I realize what's in my head isn't working, I still try to adjust on the fly. For me, it's all about uh, a strong silhouette and a good contrast between foreground and background. So if we're doing just a portraiture, I want a strong silhouette. I want to accent perhaps maybe certain elements of that fig if they have a certain molded uh, accessory that's really, really good. Thinking back to Abnormal's, um, Ab Abnormal's uh, Vi and Jin from Arcane, you know, there's they're such great designs. There's always, there's like so much I wanted to include, but I try my best to ensure that there's a, they, whatever, I want everything to work together. Sounds kind of stupid to say um, aloud, but I, I just want to make sure that each part is easily distinguished because I've seen a lot of photography out there where it's very, very, everything's dark. Everything is dark. There's a slight nuance, maybe a rim light or shadow to imply shape. And I don't want to squint to have to figure out what's going on. And so for me, it's always making sure that the background doesn't contrast with the foreground. So it's not as bright. It's a little muted. Of course, it's probably out of focus. But for the figure, I want the figures to be the star of the show. And then I often sometimes, this is something that I came to a realization of talking with Marcus one day trying to, to do a portrait. And I don't remember, Marcus, if it was for one of your figs or for one of my shots. Well, we were like, who cares about the fucking feet? Why are we trying to shoot the whole fig? Let's just zoom in on this thing and take care and, and frame up the parts that are important. And that was a that was a big deal to me. That, that was a game changer. I, back in high school, was it college, um, my photography classes, they used to call it the grandma shot. And that's where you have your person standing in the very middle of the frame, their full body. It's like, you know, the kind that you, your grandma would take, like if you're on vacation somewhere. And I really try to avoid that. So like when I did like the Daredevil post, the abnormal life break Daredevil um, portraits, I simply zoomed in from like right below the hips up because the legs aren't important. I shot at a lower angle to give it a little more prominence. And then I angled the arm specifically to um, imply direction and give the eyes lines of movement to move it around the actual canvas. 
So the batons are positioned a very specific way. So if you follow the leading lines, they t- kind of take you into a triangle motion. So your eyes are always traveling throughout the entire piece. My my main goal is, first of all, obviously elevating the, the figure and making it look great. But sometimes I'm like, I want to make a shot because like, like you said, Brett, I mainly do recreations. And sometimes like a scene isn't, necessarily the way i would want it to be to look like in a shot like for example if i take a screenshot from like a movie of a scene that i like and i think sometimes that i maybe can make it with the with a different angle and it it could maybe look better that also motivate motivates me to make that scene to actually see how my vision looks uh of that scene I feel like your um your Iron Man and rescue shot from Endgame is kind of like that. Yeah, that's a perfect example of the 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 situation. Dude, yeah. those are crazy. Yeah, I recognize it from Endgame, but I can't recall seeing this exact pose. But it captures the spirit of the film really, really well. Yeah, I kind of like that style too because it makes you kind of reimagine what you remember of that. Like, what it, you get the essence of the scene, but yet it's almost like a new look at it. You know, that you're seeing it from a different angle or with a different kind of view for the scene, which is kind of cool. Which I noticed you and both uh, uh, Castle and the Pool uh, on Instagram both kind of have looked at scenes differently that way, and I think that's pretty neat. Uh, Keith, Keith has a way of doing things that I think nobody is able to uh, mimic because I think for his recreation, um, it's all it's all about his interpretation of the she- of the scene. He always did, yeah, you know, it's from a certain scene, but he did it in his own perspective. So, which I think is pretty is pretty unique for me at least. Yeah, yeah, and he is someone that I've talked to about bringing on the podcast for another similar episode about about this. So I, I can't wait to get him on so we can talk about it because he's done some really cool stuff. Like his, uh, he did Demon in a Bottle with the classic mm-hmm. nostalgia Iron Man, and he captured the entire storyline in one shot with the figure, not even in the um, in focus, the helmet's in focus, sitting on a desk. Mm-hmm. and Iron Man's walking off frame in the foreground carrying the bottle and it's just perfect <sighs> Oof, man we got a lot. It's just so weird I don't get to talk about this stuff too often with people so. <laughs> um, what uh we, we talked about shooting we talked about lighting what about um editing uh what software um, packages do you find yourselves using um I use GIMP um, which is uh free software it's a lot similar like Photoshop, but it's not. It's a lesser version because it's free, so no complaints, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I do I do have a subscription for Live Lightroom Mobile. Um, mostly my process is after shooting, I upload the photo to my phone and then go through it um, in Lightroom, get all the uh, the adjusting that I want. And then I'll, you know, send the the photo to my email, download it in my computer, and then I'll go to GIMP and do corrections. Yeah. So for those who don't know about GIMP, G-I-M-P, it is a freeware raster-based digital editing program uh, akin to Photoshop. It's been around for a number of years. It has a very large community. So... If you're familiar with Photoshop and can't get a hold of it, GIMP is a viable alternative. It won't have all the generative AI type tools that are coming out now, but if you're familiar with Photoshop 7 through CS5, those essentials are just as strong in GIMP. It's got all the basic tools that Photoshop has. It's just not as advanced or you know user-friendly because there's a, another... If you're familiar with Photoshop, then it's much easier for you to go into GIMP and rather than the other way around, I think. I would agree. It's funny you say that too, because that's exactly what I use for so many years. 
until I finally, you know, uh, got a job and got out uh, and had some money to actually buy Illustrator. But then I got so I was like, well, you, you know, almost like you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I was like, you know, what? I'm good with GIMP. I only use Illustrator if I absolutely have to. Well, you know, there's um, also uh, Inkscape, which is a, it was a it's like it's like the Illustrator version of GIMP. It's, um, yes. it's a free vector drawing program. Yep. And that's actually where I got my start, which people are always surprised with um, before I moved to uh, full on to Illustrator. But yeah, GIMP is it's got some it's got exactly everything you need. <laughs> Sam, what software do you uh, lean on? So I use a few phone apps. So if I have yet, yeah, so there's Photoshop Mix, Photoshop Pix, Snapseed, Lightroom, Lens Effects, and Pixar. Mainly, they all are free, except Lens Effects, which is like four bucks or something, but really worth it. And that's what I have been always using, and I don't think I would ever change. This is what shocks me. Um, the first time that I heard um, Sam said he uh, he used editing on his phone. Now, yeah. the, this is crazy to me. I, I couldn't do it. I, I, and there's so many um, artists on Instagram that use their phone and solely their phone and hats off to you. I mean, it's just, hey. I need that mouse. I need that keyboard and I need that zoom and I need that wide berth of, of a viewport to see what I'm working on. So going, going back to me, I, I primarily use Photoshop. I've been using Photoshop since like version four, since before, like there were even layers involved. Then um, what I'll do is after and I'll, for Photoshop, I'm mostly using it for comp- compositing and effects and cleanup. If I feel like I want to remove that seam or I want to fill in that leg hole on the fig, mini fig, sometimes I leave it there, sometimes I don't. Or, you know, again, there's, you know, random dog or cat hair or dust that I just could not see with my eyes. Clean all that crap out. I basically get it to a point where, well, okay, excuse me. This is what I used to do. I usually just used to get to a point where it was all cleaned up, composited, the effects are in, and then I take it to Lightroom on my desktop. I just you know drag it over, but then I open up Lightroom on my phone because I want to see what's going to look like on a phone because that's where it's usually going to be viewed by most people, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in Lightroom is where I do any kind of final tweaks, uh, color grading, or exposure adjustments, you know, global, you know, global or curves adjustments. If the the blacks aren't dark enough, because because my computer monitors are a little brighter, and by general, your computer monitors are a little brighter than your phone. So quite often, what looks good on my screen may be not dark enough or have enough contrast on my phone. So I I always want to look at it where it's going to wind up eventually anyway. So Photoshop for cleanup, composition effects. Lightroom uh, for file touches. And then from Lightroom, I save it to my phone and then upload to Instagram. And then like I type my, uh, I type my captions like in Google Keep. So uh, that's the Google note-taking app. So I type in Google Keep on my desktop. As soon as I open my phone, it's already there. And then I can just copy and paste into Instagram. But what I've, I've switched around recently where I'm actually getting my basic composition done and getting my cleanup done. Then I'm going into Lightroom just to play around and get the, if the lighting the way I want, the grading and stuff, um, just to just to see how it's going to look in the end. And then I go back to Photoshop and I'll just start actually doing the effects in the final cleaning up and stuff and say, OK, this is going to work. So basically Photoshop and Lightroom are my go to's and then Google Keep to write my captions. It's just easier to type it all out on my keyboard than on my phone and I can just copy and paste. The only problem is copying from keep to Instagram, you know, the, uh, the tagging, I, I have to read manually do all the tags, but then the captioning, cause it doesn't pick that up automatically. So funny you say that too. Cause I use uh Photoshop express on my mobile phone and I, cause I, I, I learned the hard way when I uploaded an old photo, um, of one of my figs and the lighting was just not exactly how I saw it on my screen on my computer. So I started learning to doing the same thing where I uploaded to Photoshop Express on my phone, saw how it looked, and then did some last minute adjustments to 
you know, all sorts of different areas just to make it so it pops better on the phone because it's such a difference. And you don't notice that until you've done that mistake where you're like, oops, that it just doesn't look the same when you look at your Instagram on your phone versus on the computer. So I was looking back to what you were saying about working off your phone. And for the longest time, actually, up until like five seconds ago, I thought you were in Photoshop because Photoshop actually has um, functionalities to match color. Like if you take a source image and then uh, you wish to match the colors, tones, and and grading of that image to your image, you can use that as a reference and it will adjust the black levels and this, that, and the other. And I thought that's what you were doing because your uh, your matching of the tonalities of these cinematic scenes are dead on. They're absolutely dead on. Now, I I know there are programs out there that you can say like, oh, I want to select the Matrix and then it'll like... I never tried it. Yeah, Photoshop is one of those things that it can do a thousand things. You really only need to know how to do 20. Yeah, exactly. Um, And also... I'm glad they scaled back the animation and the 3D stuff. They went all in on that and then they've scaled it back a bit. And then there's also that thing that... I actually like laying down on my bed when I do my <laughs> my my, my awesome. editing stuff. So, so that's why I, I I keep it all on my phone, you know. So I'm more at ease. Oh man! I so can't like, believe you do all that amazing work on your phone. That is it, unbelievable. I can. If you said tablet, I'd be like, all right, cool. You know, I get it. Actually, I I did consider a a tablet because you know sometimes it's really hard doing that with your fingers on your phone especially with the small details. So I actually considered getting a tablet um, at some point. So why not in the future? Because I think it could uh, make it easier. And I still can lay uh, on my bed with it. So yeah, um, I'm down for it. Marcus, I think um, I have Yuatu. He uses a tablet, right? Say, who? Uh, Yuatu. I have Yuatu. Oh, I think so. Uh, I mean, I think, I, I think so. I think because I think he uses like I I could be wrong. I think he uses like ClipArt Studio Pro or he uses some program that has some recording <laughs> software built into it, so he can do his time lapses. But I'm pretty sure he's on on tablet as well. Um, you know who else is on tablets? Um, Thornton. Oh yeah, that's right, Thornton. And his stuff is amazing. I could not do it on a tablet. In fact, <laughs> the uh, color matching system I was talking about. I actually used it for my Ragnarok one. And then for the Squirrel Girl versus Thanos, I did a bit of a color match for for those figs onto that background. I'm just looking through my thing now. I pulled up a, oh, but the Bruce Lee Citizen Brick mirror scene. I pulled up a still of of the movie and I did a color match to that. Um, wow. I did some tweaking afterwards, but it's it's helped a lot. Um, it's not It's not a magic button. It's not going to do all the work for you. But it definitely gives you a head start. Adam, did you have any other questions about equipment or lighting or uh, special effect? Well, oh, special effects. We didn't talk about special effects. I was actually just going to ask something about that. Yeah, that's yeah. Go ahead. So, all right. So for myself, I'll let the secret out of the bag. I used to do a lot of my special effects manually, like all the lens flares, all the glows, all that stuff was using digital paint brushes, custom brushes. Uh, layer styles. I did it all manually. Uh, so then I was like, I'm tired of doing this by myself. So I actually downloaded a program called Oniric. Um, Oniric. O n i r i c, and it is a it is a built-in glow and lens flare generator, which has saved oh. me a lot of time. Again, it's not a magic do all <laughs> button, but it, it does give you a head start. You know the it's another interface you have to get used to. It's it's integrated. It's a plugin for Photoshop, um, not free, but the um, the owner's really cool and he's always trying to improve it. So yeah, it's, I've been doing it for a while. Um, I still go back and do some things manually because you know automation can only do so much. But special effects, mostly the glowy stuff, is um, do on Neuric, and then I do have a Shutterstock account if I need. You know, I've got I've got a large library that I bought a long time ago of different um, black plate, uh, dust and rain, snow, fire, mist, that type of stuff that I bring into Photoshop 
Um, oh, damn me down. I did. I did. And you, you can't, they, again, a lot of the tools that you use, you think there, there's no easy button. None of this stuff. It's not like, yeah. oh, I want a lens flare. Oops, lens flare. There's a lens flare button in Photoshop, but it sucks. But and that's, uh, I think that's one of your strong suit is that you're able to do all those, uh, you know, you do all those things to elevate your, your shots, which is right. something I cannot do. <laughs> well, conversely, I love the fact that you do everything in camera and get it the way you need to look in camera. There are times where I'm like, shit, I really need a highlight here. Fuck it. I'm just going to paint it in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've had to do that in the past. The the recent series I did with the Freddy Krueger Citizen Brickfig or Dash, mm -hmm. no effects at all. They were all practical. I used dishwasher soap to make the bubbles for the bathtub, the canned air to get the mist. Um, it wasn't until I got to the Freddy versus Jason one where I said, all right, now I'm going to do it my way and brought in the fire and the embers and the blood and all this other crazy stuff and the motion blurs. Oh, speaking of motion blurs, uh, Sam, I'm going to give you full credit for me using motion blur in mine. I never thought to use it. I don't know why, but it was your the Age of Ultron one you did with, with, with uh, Cap and Thor. The motion blur on that is what really nailed the cinematic look. And it wasn't until that one that I realized, shit, I need to start doing motion blur. <laughs> and then I think the first one I really did it in was um, was probably the Miles Juggernaut one. It adds so much to the, the picture. Like I, I'm looking at the Miles and Juggernaut one, like the, the, the behind the scenes and the final shot. Like just the the blurring on Juggernaut's arms make the shot look so so much more dynamic. One question I had too when uh, talking about like special effects, like um, one thing I always wondered too with yours, Sam. Like one particular, there's actually a couple that do this, but like uh, way back when you did that, the Thor from what can I think of the second Thor, Dark World, the Dark World. When you did that, it's like the recreation yeah. of the poster thing. Yeah. So how do you get the, and you did this again, I think recently with uh, Dr. Fate. How do you, I'm sure people would wonder how the heck do you do the cape like that since it doesn't sit like that on the fig? Oh, it's, it's, it's a nightmare to do. Like I basically, for example, the, uh, my latest post, I, you have to shoot all the parts separately, the, the figure with the arms, the armor piece, and then I shoot the cape in different uh, angles. And then I, I wouldn't, I don't uh, have like a, a specific way of how I want, want the cape to be. So I just r take random pics of the cape in different angles. And then I just stitch them together to see how they look. And when I have something that I like, I, I just use it. But it wasn't that hard with uh, the abnormal one because the fig already came with that cape that was, uh, like the cape was flying basically, but the Jocko one was a lot more complex because I, because I had to shoot the cape and then go like in the in those settings where you uh, alter the shape of a of a certain item to have this flying look. But but yeah, it's mainly random stitching stitching of different picks of the cape that I have until I have the the result that I want. I didn't even notice it in the Homelander one. I didn't realize you had the cape blur yeah. a lot towards the front of the, the thing. That's actually really nice. It's those small details that but, I think make the 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 picture less, you know, basic because well, it adds motion. Cool. Yeah. But also, it breaks up that giant blue shape below the belt from the belt of the legs, so you don't have this giant block of color just sitting there. Yeah. So I think a good example, better than your Dr. Fate one, of you taking parts and shooting them separately is your Spider-Man No Way Home Doc Ock versus Iron Spider shot, which is arguably probably one of my favorites you've ever made. Ah, oh, you beat me to it. I was going to ask him. <laughs> because those, sorry, Adam, your arms on that thing don't bend like that. <laughs> they do not. No, <laughs> that's like a miraculous one right there. They're not there. that good. That's what we all hope for. That's that's. <laughs> That's our expectations, but we know it's not feasible. So can you go over how you did that? So I know this is really bad form to describe visual elements yeah. over a podcast. But basically, Sam recreated the scene 
of Doc Ock versus Iron Spider, the scene where the, the coils are wrapped around twofold around Spider-Man with the claw wrapped around his head on top. And he's you know slowly picking him up. And, and what's hilarious about that is that it comes like literally, like I think it was just a few days after I posted the do not put Iron Spidey in that <laughs> group because I was like it might damage. And then all of a sudden you make that. I was like, oh, that looks great. Don't, no, just go ahead and do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you, can you go ahead and explain how you got that effect? Because the arms, they don't, yeah. you can't curl them around a minifig like that. They'd snap in pieces. Yeah. Well, first, I actually try, tried to, when I got the, the figure, which is really amazing, I, I wanted to do it like almost all practical, like have it actually holding Spidey. But then I realized that it wasn't possible. So first of all, I had to like, you know, there's like the the tentacle on the foreground, uh, which is blurred. I had to make it longer. So I, I used actually two tentacles that I assembled together. I have this one and then the one going on the top uh, attached on Doc Ock. And I showed, shot those two together. And then for uh, Spidey, I actually, uh, I had to add them to make them like really going around him. But it wasn't that bad. Like, I have. I showed you the the pictures of uh, the behind yeah, the scenes. Yeah, it's like you did a little actually, bit of uh, use a little bit yeah. of warping to them. Yeah, but they did actually wrap around uh, pretty good, and yeah, it was like just like the capes. It was uh, stitching together different parts of the of the figure, and I have to say, it was very fun to do. It was uh, very different from what I used to do, and honestly, this figure is, was a lot of fun to shoot with. Uh, what really ties it together is you really nailed matching the lighting to you, where the sun is, you know, posed in the sky. And I think he does yeah. a good job too of of balancing like where the motion is, like with the arms in the in the foreground, um, and making it you know where it looks. You can see the different depth where you're focusing on Spidey um, getting wrapped up, um, and then just, I mean, honestly, when you're looking at, it, you can't see any of the blends of all those different pieces together like you're talking about so it's just so seamless oh i mean i was gonna say um the choices that that sam made was you you let the audience like, imagine what was going on outside of the frame right so you don't necessarily need all that stuff in your in your shot but it tells the story if it tells the story then it works well, I cannot give myself credit for what you guys said because basically like the idea of not having the top uh, tentacle not visible wasn't mine. It was just what the scene showed and I just recreated it. That's one thing that I think I may never be capable of is having that those very creative ideas that you guys have because I I just try my be my best to recreate one shot from a movie uh, as best as I can in Lego, but I don't take so many creative freedom or actually have so many creative ideas. So basically all my thinking goes into how can I make this shot as close, uh, as close to what it looks like in the movie. Oh, that's, uh, that's creativity in itself, isn't it? Creativity comes in all shapes of forms. Sam, you, you, you. Sam, 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 yeah. Sam. You're doing this on your fucking phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, You're but... doing this on a phone. <laughs> That's creative Thanks. in itself. It, it, it really means a lot. I mean, I'm really, I'm really glad to see how humble everybody is. I am not. I know I'm good at what I do. I know I can, but I know I can do a lot better. And that's what I strive for. And so one day, as you guys get older, when you get to my age. Our and age. Gray, and they get yeah, our age, sorry. And the gray, hairs start com the gray hairs start coming in. <laughs> you will, uh, I hope to one day you two feel comfortable in saying, I know my shit. But at the same time, being humble enough to still say, I still have more to learn. So Marcus comes to me saying, oh, I learned so much from you. I learned a lot from Marcus. I learned a lot from you, you know, and I've been in this game for, I've been using, let's say, Photoshop for like over 20 years. 
I still learn things that I'm like, wow, that that just blows me away. I'm, it's, mine's not that good, uh, or it could have been done so much better. You know, and it's okay to be critical of yourself, but just you got to acknowledge the wins with the losses. That's all I'm trying to say. Brett, do you think that the the confidence you have uh, regarding your stuff also comes from the fact that you have you you have done studies uh, revolving around editing, right? Um, I've done a lot of personal research when I was younger and just graduating college. When I went to college, graphic design was so. First of all, I have a degree in I have a BFA in fine arts with an emphasis in graphic design and uh, fine art, fine paint, um, excuse me, in paint, just, you know, manual paintbrush painting. Oh. I took the painting to learn more about color theory. Now, I've had all my career has been built around this stuff. But the thing about graphic design is it's like a restaurant. A restaurant is only as good as the last dish it puts out. It doesn't matter how many Michelin stars you won in 1995. If your shit ain't hitting now, then it means nothing. So the challenge with being a graphic designer is you have to always evolve. You always have to be looking at what is coming out. Um, I can tell you right now, I find it very difficult to be commercially competitive because of what these students that are growing up in a digital age are putting out. Are, it's just so amazing. My kids, my teenagers, hell, when they were at six, they were at every step of the day, way, they've been more advanced in their creative art and the disciplines they've learned than I ever was at that age. Because when I was their age, we didn't have the internet. I was just, co I was just copying comic books and drawing my own ideas. So I, I work in an industry that I've got job security. I don't have to compete with the commercial sector. I'd be terrified too, to be honest with you. Because, yeah, fair enough. you know, the up and comers are just that much more. They're, they're not as experienced in the real world, but they're much more experienced in what's possible. And their eyes have been open. They're exposed. You guys live in an age where if you have an artist that you like, you can literally just sit them, send them a DM and they might answer. I mean, it's yeah. incredible. Uh, I don't say that of any sort of uh, bitterness or jealousy or, you know, back in my day, it, it's it's amazing. And I, I implore everyone to take advantage of it. I mean, you've right now, look at this, you've got three digital photographers and, you know, and, and editors on a podcast spilling information out. This wouldn't have existed five years ago, 10 years ago. I, I think my confidence comes from the fact that I've managed to survive this long. <laughs> that's basically it I, I've, I'm the dinosaur that dodged the meteor and I think if I can do that I can, I'm still hanging with the best of them where I lack maybe in creative vision due to my age and being settled into my own uh, devices and patterns that I fall into I make up for in my knowledge of the basic fundamentals and principles of design in color theory that's where my strong suit is so that if and I used to teach at some at one point and I'd have all these kids coming in that, again, learned, knew all these programs. And I'm making them do basic stuff because it was a basic multimedia course. So they get bored and they start trying to do all this fancy shit. And they would fail because they couldn't follow simple directions, right? We wanted this. These are your requirements. This is what you were supposed to execute. I don't care how nice or pretty this is. And by the way, could it look nicer if you just done this, 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 and this? And then by showing them how to enhance their designs using just Fundamentals of layout and composition, color theory. I would re earn their respect because they didn't think I just didn't know what I was talking about because I'm reading from a lesson plan that was you know given to me. So um, the painting degree, I think the painting part was probably more important than the graphic design part because we barely had Photoshop and Illustrator when I was when I was in college. We didn't even have a color printer in our graphics department during my freshman year. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. So. If I, if I sound cocky or whatever, I, it's only because I've, I've made it this far. And um, I know I've put out good work. I know I'm capable of good work because if I don't believe I can put out good work, I'll stop trying. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. That's one thing that I noticed when we talked about a few stuff. Like sometimes I do... Uh, things on my pictures that I do only because they look cool, they look nice. But then when we talk about it, you actually give those stuff names and they are actually techniques that p 
people learn and use and that's how i need I, how i um, <clears throat> realized that you had uh, so much knowledge about this stuff and that's what you were talking about with those students like they they did this stuff but they didn't know the the theory or the right. um, the process behind it yeah the photoshop illustrator you know i don't care if you're using blender or unreal engine none of these amazing tools and all these different facets of of creativity can do the work even like ai you know that's a whole other podcast but i can tell when i see the ai i can tell if it if it does something that works it's a crap shoot it may look good but it's not composed well you see what i'm saying there, yeah. there's, there's a harmony that will be missing and, and it almost comes across as empty well, that's a whole other conversation for another day. So um, we all have our pain points. You touched on one before about how some of these figs aren't built a certain way. Marcus, do you have any particular things that really annoy you with our, or things that you find? Well, we Because sometimes we're only showing the final product, so people might think we're making this easy. It's really not. What, what do you think some of the pain points are? For me? Uh, in general, sure. Okay. Um, the first thing is glares. Um, because um, many figures are plastic, so um, when you put a light it directly in front of it, you see a huge glare, and I hate that. So I think you you will not find mm, glares on my shot in my shots. Um, I used to edit them out, but now I uh, I keep it as minimum as possible. I do have them in my shots, but um, I try to avoid them as much as I can. So glare is number one. And number two is um, how the light lighting looks. Um, it's a pain for me as well. It, it might sound weird because um, you guys um, said I'm that technical, but um, I do fell from, fell from time to time. And... Um, I think when the lighting does not work, I can tell immediately. And I usually just, you know, dump the shot and go over it again. Because for the Wolverine shot, I actually shot it three times um, in three sessions because the pose was one right or the lighting one right. So I redid the shot all over again. Yeah, yeah. How many shots? What's the great? So we only post one shot, right? The mm -hmm. one that we think is the winner that we modified. Marcus, mm -hmm. how many shots? What's the what's the record holder for how many shots you took to get a shot right? Um, well, I'm just I, just I, guessing. Maybe you remember specifics. It's okay. Well, I think my process is very different from everybody else because what I heard from some photographers, they 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 tend to shoot a lot. One. Like, for instance, one angle, one shot. But I always use my viewfinder to to look at a shot or not the shot, the image. And I try to adjust it along the way. But I never pull the trigger because I just want to see how everything looks. Because I check every aspect of, of the image to get it right. To get um, where the lighting that I want, um, the composition that I want, the angle that I want. So I took a lot of time to just take one shot. You imagine um, taking an hour to just look at the viewfinder <laughs> and not doing anything or just look at the viewfinder and try to adjust the lighting for an hour and then take one shot and you don't like it. <laughs> so that's an, an hour of waste, right? So the most that I've taken for one one single post, I think would be nine to 10 shots. And that's usually about three sessions. Each session takes about two to three hours for me. So yeah. Oh, uh, so I would say I've, got, I've usually gone up to 20 or 30 shots uh, when I first started this, trying to get it right. But it was always, so my biggest pain point is the posing. Before I started really getting into the, using the viewfinder to, again, it seems like a, a no shit moment. But when I started really getting to the viewfinder, just taking the shot, thinking I had it figured out, and then pulling up the memory card, going to my computer, pulling it up, and then like, well, crap, that didn't work. 
the reason it didn't work is usually because of posing. And I'll find that like one character isn't looking in the direction I wanted to. The hair has been it got bumped and now it's like tilted to the side or turned one direction that it's not supposed to be. It's not straight on the head. Or um, the ticky sticky tack isn't working and the arm is slowly dropping with each passing second. <laughs> yeah. That's so frustrating. frustrating. The, the, and then my second pain point is lens, uh, lens correction. And this is something I need to get better at. When shooting with the camera, find the proper distance so that lens distortion doesn't start kicking in and start bowing the image that I saw that I have to correct it in Photoshop. For those who may not be aware, in Photoshop, there is a lens correction tool. You can actually download or, or input your model of lens and camera, and it will auto-correct. But more often than not, I find myself doing it manually anyway. I'll have something that looks really great, but it's supposed to be straight. And for some reason, it's like the, like the, the outsides are tilted in a little bit. Cause it starts getting Because I was too close when I took the shot. And so I would say posing is probably my, my biggest, or I'll have everything right. And then I'm actually doing like a portrait where I want to see the head to, you know, head to toe. And like the legs weren't perfectly flat on the ground. So there's a little space between one foot and the ground. And that's really annoying. But I would say po posing and setup are probably my biggest pain points. Mostly when taking the figs apart and reassembling them using sticky tack to get that arm at the right angle or that leg, you know, that look even the effect, like the knees being pulled in. Sam, do you have any particular pain points? I have uh, the two ones that you guys mentioned. First of all, glares, especially on the, on the pig, on the pig's face. It's, it's so annoying because like I said, I shoot with uh, two soft boxes. So I cannot really move the, the light around. So I try to to move my fig like left to right and see if it like removes them. And also posing. Like I love posing my customs uh, because I think what's an interesting with shooting is also offering a an int a new perspective of how you 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 show the figure. And not many people actually pose the figs, uh, the custom ones, especially the way we do. And, uh, you know, like finding the, the right pose, the right angle to show it off the best is sometimes, sometimes, sometimes extremely long. But I would say my biggest pain point is actually doesn't even come from like shooting or editing. It's finding the idea. That is why I, I said earlier that I, you, I cannot credit myself for uh, creativity because I take uh, a shot and just do it in Lego. So it's so hard for me to sometimes find an idea. Like I have a, a figure that I want to shoot, but I don't, do not know what to do with it because there's not enough reference in the movie or the show, uh, it appeared in and finding my own idea, uh, ideas are so challenging sometimes. So that would be my biggest pain point with uh, what I do. So I did a quick Google search while you were talking. The Marvel Cinematic Universe, currently the run times add up to 6,787 minutes. About 110 hours of Marvel movies and TV series to watch. So to say That's you're not insane. creative or you're not as creative, you are using that creative eye to identify a scene that you know would look good in Lego, that people would identify and appreciate. And you're, you're trying to identify one frame out of 110 hours worth of footage. I didn't it's realize true. it was that long, actually. But you have to have a good eye for composition and layout and color and want to understand, okay, what, what scene or image best represents this movie in a way that look, would look good in Lego. So give yourself a little credit. That's a lot, of, a lot of raw material to sort through. You're looking for a needle and a stack of needles. It's completely true. I'll yeah, even give you an example. We were thing. talking, Sam and I were talking about uh, some particular shots a while back. And I had an idea that I thought, oh, this will be way better if you just shoot this one. And then he had a different idea for one. And when he took the picture, I was like, oh, man, that looks way better than what I had just because of the way. It's like he could 
think of like how the figure would look in that versus in whether it was, you know, uh, had enough action to it or had enough, um, dynamics, uh, dynamism, dynamism, dynamism in the shot versus the one I was looking at. So it's, it's actually a good skill to have to pick out what would look good with that figure versus just what was a cool shot from the movie. Cause that's easy to do, but not easy to transition into a good shot with a minifigure. Cause that's, that's a completely different thing. Yeah. Mo- most iconic shots in movies that like directors get applause for are like, you know, establishment shots showing environment and scenery. It's not always really about characters. So right. Like for example, uh, I know for a while people were trying to take photos of that, shot from Endgame with all the the different guys lining up for the uh you know Avengers assemble shot and you know that wasn't the greatest shot I don't think from that movie I've seen from people take fi- pictures of it's usually more subtle you know um moments from the movie um so it's not always you know what you think it would be so you know when Sam's able to pick out something like that it's it's a it's a tough thing to do to picture what would look good with a minifigure or with that particular minifigure yeah i would think a scene from Endgame would be like you know, Peter in the crater holding the Infinity Gauntlet. That would be a good scene to see in Lego format. Mm-hmm. And that would be yep. more iconic of the movie that people recently recognize where it's from. Yep, agreed. All right, so a little more upbeat. What is, Marcus, the favorite shot you've ever shot of your own stuff? And um, why? Okay. Um, and we're talking, was... <laughs> it could be a, because of, sorry, it could be because of a technical achievement, the overall product, or something you learned along the way, or whatever. Okay, um, I have five shots that I like the most. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> For different reasons. Um, the first one is with the uh, Jin classic Iron Man, that Mark one that he did with uh, Lucky Joy. Um, that was the first time that I realized that I can do such a thing. It's almost like a product shoot. And the lighting, I was very impressed with myself, to be honest, with the lighting. And I I never felt like that before. Um, so that's the first one that I like the most. It's it's um it's like kind of like a breaking point for me because from then on I was kinda I think my light work has been improving each shot, um, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And the next one is Spider Man Noir. Is that how you pronounce it? Noor. Yeah. Oh, Spider Noor. Um, that one. Trench coat really, guy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I really like the pose. Even though it's very um um it's just an angle, but I really like the uh the uh the emotion of the, the second slide. Yeah, I was um, just looking at the second slide. It's really cropped tight, looks really good. I thought it's really intense, even though it's uh very um still post. But it's very intense, um, and I really liked it. For the third one, I would say is the uh, the shot that you mentioned, the Batman. Oh, the one with his back to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like that one because the it reminds me so much of Mister Lee, and I'm not saying that I I, I was trying to um, copy him or anything, but. That shot made me realize that I am onto something that's a photographer that I admire for so long, and I can do something similar to his level. So that's the that's the third one, and the last two are the recreations that I did. Um, one is with the Joker in the uh, in the uh, the cell. I really like that one because um, I was trying to do what was in the movie. You can really tell it's my shots, and but it's also a recreation from a different perspective. So I really liked it. And the other one would be the uh, the Mando shot, the one he met Grogu. It was a lot of effort behind it because I built a, a huge mock for it, but only a small portion of the mock was shown in the image. But I really liked it. Everything was done naturally and no only slight editing. Marcus, your uh, Joker, I for me, your Joker one is like my all time favorite shot that you did. But I also feel like after this shot, your content, like 
was on a whole other level like it was so much like be, even before that your stuff was so clean but right after that I, I i don't know what happened but your stuff was just even more mind-blowing so that joker shot really holds a, a special spot for me because it's i i don't know what happened to you when you shot that and but your stuff really got on on a whole other level just after the, after that picture oh man thank you i would say i think what probably probably changed it for me is how i approach not how i approach um because i always struggle with inspiration and ideas of what you shoot like you do i think most people has that and i think for me after sh that shot i always try to mix things up for instance um I do. I always try to do one portrait and one something that takes effort. Not that um, portrait shots don't take effort, but um, what I meant was I try to brainstorm a lot more. If that makes yeah. sense, <laughs> I used to think my content is a little bit boring because it's all about portraits, nothing more. After that, Joker shot really opened my eye about. Um, what I can do and you can see after that Joker shot I did the Punisher shot and I did a Mendo shot and a ba Batman shot with Mox and that's really something wasn't new for me uh, but I wasn't doing it on a more constant basis so I think yeah that really that Joker shot really helped me to realize that I can do a lot more things than just portraits. How about you, Sam? Well, if I may, I have uh, three uh, shots. So the the first one isn't one that many would think of, but it's my Endgame poster because, well, I love the movie a lot and I'm a huge MCU fan. And this was like my my uh, how do we say that in english my tribute yes that that would be the word it was my tribute to the movie and it was really like the definitive version of the poster like i don't think i could make it uh, any better and uh, then there's the 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 god of thunder one with uh, adam and gb gb's figure the oh the lightning the, the infinity war one yeah, I, I just love it so much. I don't even know how I managed to get this get this result. Like, I don't even know if I could redo it. <laughs> but it, it, it was a bunch of messing around uh, during the editing process that made it look so good and I'm so happy. And the third one is, it may not be the most appealing one, like, visually, but it's a shot that really meant a lot to me. It was the, the, the composition one that I did with the life brick, brick, uh, captain figure, you know, of that fight between Bucky and, and Steve on the, on the heli carrier, because I had just rewatched, rewatched Captain America, uh, two. And mm -hmm. this, the, the, the final scene is like one of my favorite scenes of the entire MCU. And it made, it made me, it made me cry. And right, right after I finished the movie, I was like, I need to redo that in, in Lego right now. And I was so happy because I think I was able to, um, uh, to uh, show, uh, in this picture what I felt, uh, about this shot, you know, with that fight between two friends. It was so heartbreaking. So I was really happy of that, of that final result, but. It's not like when I when I am looking at it right now, and it has its flaws, but I'm really happy of it because it really got that feeling that I felt when I watched the scene. You know, it's funny. Um, obviously, I love all the ones you took of my figures, but I think, <laughs> uh, especially you know, like the Mando ones and the uh, Iron Spidey ones. But I gotta say, when I was just looking at your stream again. One of the coolest shots I think I've ever seen you do. Just the way you captured it and the way it uh well first let me say the picture what it is is the one where it's spider-man from no way home where he's standing in front of the video oh, from yeah. uh, j jonah jameson talking where his his uh aunt just died 
and you have the rain falling. It's the way that you put it all together, the lighting, the rain effect, the mood, the way you have it positioned. Everything about that is just so perfect. Like I've never, I, it's almost like, uh, it's almost, you got the photorealism, but you have also like, it feels like it's from the movie too. It's just, it was really cool how you put that together. It feels um, like a digital still from a Lego movie. Right, right. It's 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 something that I've never. It's almost like uh, you know, I've, you've kind of got that style that you've kind of honed over the years, especially the last year or two. But this one was almost like a different aspect of your shooting that you're able. I don't know if you used a different camera or the way that you set it up was different, but it just felt like like you were trying something different, and it really you really pulled it off or something. But it was really cool how you put all those different elements together. Thanks, mom. Well, this shot does actually fe feature a part of your thing because the arms are from your flying <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, one thing one um, that I was hoping you were going to mention, actually two, the garage chase of Black Panther and Captain America. That's, <clears> that was <throat> really good. Mm -hmm. Capturing the feel of the movie. But I'll, honestly, the one that blew me away, like for the first time I ever saw it, it was just Besides the Age of Ultron, we already mentioned, was your um, your MK1 uh, emerging from the cave. Oh, from the cave one, yeah. yeah. It it just it's just that was the first time I was like, man, this this kid is just you know matching this lighting of these scenes so perfectly. It just, means a lot, man. It really it's disgusting. I hate you for it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does, kind of, you know, it's like that other shot we were just talking about. It looks like it's like if Lego made that movie as realistic as possible that's what it would look like yeah exactly uh, i guess it's my turn um well yeah i'm gonna shit I, I could talk all day about my stuff and which ones have meaning to me all right well the ones that aren't technically the best but uh, they have meaning to me is well basically anything that involves more than just taking a photo like it revolves around like building something or using practical effects. I've really enjoyed that a lot. And so like the, the cover I did of Web of Spider-Man 4, which is the Craven's Last Hunt, where Spider-Man's coming out of the grave in front of his, his tombstone. I gotta find this it's one. So it's, good. it's down there. It's it's right below before my one year anniversary. Uh and if you scroll through the slides, you can see the original poster. I had a lot of fun with that. And the reason this one meant a lot to me was because I actually literally took a fig apart and threw dirt and mud on it. I'd spent so much time trying to get the the pose right. But um, yeah, putting dirt on the fig and I actually did a lot of research on what gravestones, how to build one in Lego format. I looked up all these mocks. You know, then of course I looked at the comic book cover and I realized that I take some sort of creative liberties so that it would look good in Lego form. But I feel like I got the lighting right on the grave site to get all the little surface areas accentuated. And um, I, you can ask Marcus, for the longest time, I was bitching about any time someone did rain in a, in a post. It was a real <laughs> bothersome thing with me because they never did rain right. Um, they would just slap a, a rain pattern over the entire thing. I'm like, that's not how you show rain. So I literally took a spray bottle and I sprayed my thing down. I got him wet. I got the gravestone wet. But then I added those little splashes in post-production showing where the rain was hitting. So that's that's one, because there was a lot of technical achievements for me. It was my first real mock. And I really love that story uh, in comics. <laughs> my Ragnarok arena is probably one of my top. And it's not because of the final product and how good it turned out. It's because it just shows the before and after shows how far I've grown in doing this type of work. And I really felt like that point, I felt like I've, 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 I've come, I made it, you know? So yeah. that was, that was important to me. And then um, pretty much any, any, any post that I've made where I was able to tell a story in one panel, that's not typical. They don't always get the most uh, likes or exposure or whatever, but I really enjoy them. Like I made that mock, the daredevil hallway fight scene and i've reused that mock several times modifying it and i did a i did a post with like the main character from squid game uh with the saw trap on his head and the saw billy puppet on his tricycle coming out of the darkness 
And I was like, I thought that was kind of funny. It'd be like a cool crossover, you know? So I like, I like doing those quirky little, little things like that. I think um, the John Wick one where he's in a bar or nightclub surrounded by pencils. pencils holding a pencil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a lot of fun. That's so funny. But um, I think the most recent thing that I'm really, oh yeah. And the squirrel girl, you know, t- killing or taking down Thanos in Endgame, flipping the, mm-hmm. sitting on his chest and flipping him the bird. <laughs> I just I don't want to have fun with this stuff. I think it's they don't always get the most visibility or become the most popular posts, but to me they're my favorite. But the most recent thing that I'm really happy with, because uh, it took me out of my element, I like being challenged. Is uh, I've told this story before, but Dash Bricks gave me um, a special dyed version of the Citizen Brick Freddy Krueger fig, on the premise that I would do three posts with it. So I had to come up with three original posts with the Freddy figure. And I wound up gravitating towards not doing any special effects and all practical effects. And I did the bathroom scene, bathtub scene with the glove coming out of the suds between her between her legs while she's sleeping in the tub. I did Freddy coming down the alleyway that was all smoky and dusty. And then finally, yes, I did get into effects and did Freddy versus Jason. And those were probably my biggest gaps in in posting new stuff because I was putting so much you know thought into it because I want to do it right because you know guy gave me a free fig. But in the end I think they've come at some of my most favorite posts because again they're just telling a story in one panel. And Marcus, I'm surprised you didn't mention this. I'm gonna do one more favorite. I'm gonna take the record from you. And I really loved our Iron Man Cave Tony uh collaboration. And the reason I love this is because I bought the mock from Block Lock Mock. Uh, yeah, three times fast. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I brought in, I used the LCM Mark One, which was all nice and hand painted and dirty. And I set up some lights, or I photoshopped in what looked like a light set. You know, lighting the workbench. I had Tony holding the thing, and I was really proud of this thing. I really liked it because I hadn't really done a lot of mock work in it before. And then Marcus does his, which is posted right before mine in in my feed, and all it is is Tony holding the hammer, staring at the out-of-focus Mark One helmet. The background's bokeh, you know, it's all out of focus. And I'm like, this dude did such a good job with such a minimal amount of elements. And here I thought I was doing a really good, you know, it's awesome scene. But I feel like our two things side by side, it's like an amateur movie director versus like <laughs> a pro <laughs> cinematic director. You know what I mean? Yeah, you give yourself too much or too little credit. It's it's a great it's a great photo on its own. I like think in technically, a it's way, a great know? shot. But if you look at the two, it's like it blows mine away. It really does. And so, Marcus, that's probably one of my favorite shots of yours that you've done. Well, not the most technical lighting and you know all that stuff. It just showed what's possible when looking at something differently, and you don't have to have everything in there to tell a story you could do it with just the bare minimum Thank and you. if you and if you notice the first shot i did after that collaboration was the ultron mark one. Oh yeah and all, and all i did was a graded lego plate um lego great thingy behind it photoshopped in some wires and sparks and let the figure do the talking and that became one of my most liked posts of all time <laughs> yeah that's right yeah i see and, that and that was directly influenced by what you did with Tony. So thank you. <laughs> Saying I'm surprised you didn't mention the chainsaw man shot you did. Like especially the the one where you edited it to make it look like it's uh it's I, I wrote like that down in my notes to bring it up. It's so good. I love the chainsaw man one I did. That that lighting on that couldn't have gone any better the first time. Uh with the magenta and the green. And Doing the anime version was a lot of fun. But like I said, I can go on all night, but it all sound really conceited about the things I like about my own work. Um, someone asked me what my style is, and I simply just reply, um, not shit. Because <laughs> I, I don't have a style. I mean, basically just do what I feel like, and I think that's helped me move forward because sometimes I just have cool ideas, and my goal is to entertain people. So I don't, you know... Whether it's on a technical but, level or a comedy level or whatever, I don't really, um, I don't really have a goal. Like, 
it gives you more freedom, don't you think, though, too? Because uh, like when I was looking through and thinking, what what was my be my favorites of your account? And there are three different ones of three different styles. Um, you mentioned one of them, the one with the uh, the glove coming up of uh, Freddy Krueger from the bathtub. Yeah, I, I look at that all the time. I was a huge 80s horror fan and you just nailed every aspect of that. That was just it's so clean, uh, creative elements with the bubbles. The uh, and all the way that you set that up, that's one style. And then you have another one that's more like the posing style, where it's like uh, the one with the uh, the the black. Uh, what's the name of uh, the Thanos? Uh, the Black Order. Uh, there you go. The one that's right before that, with where it's more about the lighting and just a, uh, like a like a profile of the f- four of them together. And then the other one I liked is the the one that you did with the the Thor at Ragnarok one. You know, like a cinematic shot. And those three are all different styles and and formats so i mean it gives you freedom but yet different challenges i'm i'm assuming with each one of them because they have different things that they need like you have to do a mock for the the bathtub the other one's more about lighting and getting the figures right and those kind of things would, yeah. would you I say lo- that's i would love true? to do more mocks i really would i really enjoy putting these together or trying to do practical effects like the bruce lee one with the mirror scene that was a real if you look at the, the slides on that you'll see how messy <laughs> of a process that really was I probably spent maybe oh, yeah. an hour and a half figuring out how the hell do you get these things to reflect properly um, without reflecting onto each other and then keeping my fingerprints off of them. So yeah, no, there's a lot of freedom when you really don't adhere to a particular thing. So I don't know. I, mean, I don't know, Sam, maybe one day you'll just be like, I'm done with the cinematic universe. I'm going to start Who doing another thing. Or even like Keith, where he just started doing, uh, he started doing from time to time his own little story, you know, uh, creatively out of nowhere, you know. Uh, you know what you, or you could do like look up Google uh, classic comic panels. Yeah, Keith did that one that was a tribute to like Jack Kirby with the Spider Man silhouette um, ghost oh, outline on the so wall. Good. Yeah, he, he worked on that one a lot. I don't think folks listening may understand how long some of these things take. I've spent, literally six to eight hours sometimes on an edit the quickest one i did was probably an hour from start to finish and of all things it was the die hard one oh I just, really it was i just i said i got an idea I took out some window panes from the daily bugle i shoved a light in the room next door oh yeah and I, I took my, and I took my phone and i was like let's see what I can do i was like you know what one two three got it and i'm like it's not gonna get any better than this um i wanted to do the whole close-up like the movie but i just i didn't feel that would work with lego so and it worked (laughs) that's awesome now sam you know i'm a huge fan of the mcu shot to do so you can keep going with those two that's okay (laughs) (laughs) and mandalorian the mando the phoenix and cold blood for some mando lineup is like maybe the best lineup I have in my in, in my display right now. Like it's like the consistency between the figs and and just having them together is is so good and expensive too, but so good. <laughs> well, um, we went over a lot of tips. I, I had a whole section dedicated to like tips and tricks and uh, for this conversation, but we've gone over a lot of them already. So I just want to rehash some of them really quick, and then if you guys want to add one or two more, that's great. We talked about using the viewfinder to frame your shot rather than using your eyes to help figure out where your lighting should be, you know, get your pose and your composition. We mentioned some folks like to draw if they can't visualize it in their head. We talked about being flexible, going from camera to phone and back to camera, whatever works for that particular moment, taking multiple shots of different custom parts and then stacking them together or stitching them together, so to speak, to get the pose you might need. Sticky tack is a poser's best friend and super cheap and it doesn't damage the print. If you get sticky tack stuck in a crevice in a minifig, the best way to get it out is using sticky tack. Just blot it away and it will come out. The one I wanted to add is, so if you're going to do a collage of elements, like you have, you shot your your pieces differently, uh, you shot a mock or a fig that you're gonna put into the mock in post edits, or you're one of those folks that uses your laptop to pull up the scenery behind the figure. If you want to make it look cohesive and look like all the elements belong together and it doesn't look like a cut and paste job, 
in, in Photoshop, it's really easy to um, create a, a layer, fill it with white, and then just go to the filter, add noise, Gaussian, monochromatic, and just so you get that like TV snow look. And then just set the blend mode to, uh, you set it to multiply, and then the white will disappear, and then the noise will still show through. And that will actually bring a, it doesn't exactly bring grain if you if you know how to do this right. It will, but it will give a uh, a bit of a texture to everything in your in your um, in your composition, and therefore it will give it that more unified look, and not feel like something's sticking out. Or to avoid it, you can just shoot everything practical and have everything like like Marcus does with the figure inside an actual mock. But for those like myself that do a lot of composition, you're bringing in a fire element, you're bringing in like some rubble or debris to put in the foreground, and then you've got your background, but it's a movie still. Once you have it all put together and you're happy with the way it is, the effects are done, the lighting's done, add a layer of noise. And that will really make it look seamlessly like it all ties together. The other tip is focus stacking. I don't know. I know, Marcus, you you do it sometimes. Uh, Sam, I don't know if you've ever done this before, but the idea is basically if you're having a problem with your depth of field or your situation recalls for it and you want certain elements to be in um, in focus, but you can't, you can only focus on one part at a time and you don't know how to correctly uh, adjust your depth of field, you can just shoot multiple shots at different focal lengths and then uh, stack them together using layer masking in Photoshop or your tool of choice. I do this a lot when it comes time to doing my Spider-Man group shots, like when I do the Spideyverse shots. Naturally, I'm focusing on, you know, one fig, and which will maybe take up the first two and the last two rows behind it. But inevitably, I always have to do another shot of figures that are in the back rows, and then I just mask off. I stack them together in Photoshop and then just mask off, revealing the in-focus rows for each shot. Those are my two big tips. Sam, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, I wouldn't have any like technical tips, but it's just one thing I w- I would like to say is just have fun, man. Like you know, sometimes uh, there's a lot of people that DM me and ask me like precisely how one process needs to be done. Uh, like for example, when when it comes to effects or even color grading. But honestly, even I couldn't like say how I do it. Like for example, like the the last thing I always do, which uh, for me brings the, the shot together is uh, going through Lightroom and doing the, the final color gradings. And I honestly just do it very randomly, like see what looks uh, great and what doesn't. And I think that's what uh, many people should do, especially if you're new. And that's how you actually learn uh, uh, new stuff. If you're not having fun with this, there's no point. Yeah, considering all the hours you have to put into it, yeah, if it's not fun, you got to have fun. You got to be excited to go do it, you know, especially with all the time you put into it. Yeah, exactly. Marcus, you got anything you'd like to add? So I would suggest to people is to uh, use Bounce. I think Bounce is a very important tool. If you want to perfect your lighting, I think uh, I think a lot of people use Bounce as well. Um, you see a lot of photographers use it in their BTS. And a bounce can only, you know, can just be a piece of white paper. The purpose of it is just to redirect um, your key lights onto your subject. And it, it provides a very soft tone because we're shooting with minifigures and minifigures tend, they're plastic. Um, oftentimes you'll find glares on it. And with a bounce, you can usually gives a softer tone on on the subject and then it's pretty useful. I think probably with all my shots, I use bounce all the time. Um, with the style of my shots, bounce is really good for me. So sometimes Brad asks me, how do you achieve certain look? And then when I show him the BTS, he's like, oh, okay, that's why. Actually, I'm thinking about, you know, putting BTS on my threads. So, um, People will understand more when, when I do show my BTS. It's a learning curve as well to, um, to learn how to use a bounce. Yeah, all my, my shots, the light is never directly shining on the subject. It's always bouncing off something. 
this is what the very principle that light boxes work off of, you know, but the fact that every surface is white, so the light bounces off and gives you that even balanced lighting for, you know, product photography or whatever. So I actually have like ripped up pieces of foam core. I've pulled paper out of my my desktop printer. Uh, I've used all sorts of crazy shit to bounce uh, light off. I've used books off my shelf whenever I felt because it wasn't always have to be white either. Sometimes the bounce is too bright and then the outline of the paper or the foam core starts reflecting into the minifigure. Mm-hmm. So it's something you definitely got to play with. And the other thing is, I guess it's not a tip. Uh, it's not a trick, but a tip of sorts. Um, you just have to, you know, try a lot of different angles when you're shooting. Because for me, um, sometimes I usually take two or three sessions to get one shot right. Uh, if you do it one time and get it perfect, then good. But you'll find a lot of new outcomes or results if you try different angles and you'll see new possibilities. One one last tip I thought about, I actually did a video about this weeks ago and I left it on my, you know, I left it on my reels is basically, you know, sometimes you have to go backwards to go forwards, meaning that it's okay to like, it's okay to, to, to let go and sometimes the shot's just not going to work. So it may be beneficial to simply uh, throw in a towel, so to speak, and try to tackle from a different angle or go back a few steps. Kind of like, kind of like going down, you're going down a road, you hit a fork, you went left. Well, maybe you need to go back to the fork and hook a right and try a different approach to get where you need to go. That's the best way I sum it up quickly. But don't ever get so dug in that and keep beating your head against the wall trying to overcome something when you might instead just be able to walk around it or go under it or go over it instead of trying to go through it. Uh, That'd be my one last tip. I think that's a great tip for any kind of creativity or doing something in a creative mode like this. uh, When people ask me all the time, what's the first tip you'd give new designers or people trying to get into the custom market and design figures? It's the same thing I think you're saying with photography. It's 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 important to know that you can beat your head against the wall trying to come up with the perfect thing. And sometimes it just, the best thing you could do is just let it sit and walk away. And maybe when you come back, you'll have a fresh viewpoint on what you need to change or adjust. Or maybe you just want to say, I came up with a way better idea. Scrap it, start from scratch. Because I think a lot of people, when they're in a creative mode, they just want to force it. Even though it's not feeling 100%. Um, and I think that can be a mistake, you know, and yeah, it's okay to make mistakes too and take that photo. And, but I mean, sometimes people need to just step away, take a minute, let them digest what they just did or what they're about to create if they're in the midst of the process. And sometimes that gives clarity to what you really want to do or what you're trying to achieve. So I think that is important, especially if you're, you know, doing something as creative and especially the longer you guys go, like you guys have for for years where you get super nitpicky or maybe just stepping away, you come with that clarity the next time you come to do that thing. One thing that we talked about, and I think Sam touched on it was about enjoying yourself and being happy. And we talked about all the effort, Adam, you referred to all the uh, the work we put into these things and the hours and whatnot. The one big buzzkill I would think is hitting most photographers is the algorithm of Instagram. This is where I think there becomes a bit of a, um, I don't want to use the word maturity, but there's a, this is where your self-confidence has to come into play. And you have to be aware that you know you did a good job. Because right now, trying to get exposure on Instagram and trying to break it with the Explore tab and get that all your work, hard work noticed It's very, very limited. I mean, there's not a single person that I know from people that have 100 followers to people that have 50,000 followers that haven't seen a significant drop in engagement and activity through all the crazy stuff that Instagram's doing. For those who are struggling, I just want to remind you that Instagram is not a creative artwork platform. It is a social media app originally to engage for people to engage and share bits and pieces of their life where people want to quickly scroll through, look at some photos, like, and move on, um, or get more connected to brands or, or personalities that they've developed some sort of parasocial relationship with Flickr 
which is where a lot of the custom community resided before Instagram, is probably more geared towards that creative spot where you your work and your efforts might be more appreciated. But we're all on Instagram, so we want to stay on Instagram. That being said, besides the normal um, spiel I do about networking and engaging people and don't be a prick to build your network, you have to understand that sometimes the one piece, the pieces you put the most work and love into may not get the exposure that you want. Personally, I focus on the stats. I focus on, was it was it called engagement? Not engagement, um, accounts reached. Because not everyone's going to like a post. Not everyone's going to comment on a post. But accounts reached at least shows me that someone saw it. And I think that's what's important to me because I want the world to see my work. I don't need their like for a validation. I don't need their story share. Or, or you know, I love comments personally because I get a chance to engage with people and answer questions. But overall, accounts reach is probably my favorite um, stat to to look at. And that has been taken a quite, a quite a bit of a, a dump. That being said, I think Forbrix Tall, she's a Lego ambassador and a Lego photographer. She put out a blog post not too long ago explaining why certain posts have more exposure and engagement than others. You, you see how it is. You know, you spend hours, you do this complex scene. It looks cinematic. Colors are on point. It could be on a poster. And then somebody else just, you know, took a picture of a fig in front of a white background and that thing's just blowing up left and right. Um, it doesn't mean your stuff's not good, but there's something to be said about people engaging on social media that are quickly scrolling through. Those types of photos, those simple photos are easy to, for the brain to process, right? It's You can go in and try and play Dark Souls or you can play Candy Crush, you know, the latter is easier on the brain. You can just pick up, play, and move on. You don't have to think. It's mindless you know, entertainment, but it gives you that stimulation of your brain where it doesn't have to work as much. And her theory was that's probably why these complex ones, like the ones I do with big backgrounds and all this great stuff, may not fare as well as the ones that I do when it's just like a stack of Spideys you know, on a blank background. It's because it's easy to engage and recognizable. The brain doesn't have to process what's going on. The subjects stand out. Uh, I think it's a really interesting blog post. I'm going to link to it in the show notes. I don't think that anyone should change their content to appease that. Just understand that that might be a reason as to why. It's funny that you mention uh, this study that she did because there was a time where uh, when I actually started Instagram, no, not exactly when I started, but like two years after, like during the Infinity War era, where like my biggest indicator, like to if my post was good or bad, were the likes. And I was seeing that the more simple stuff made so much more likes. And I actually, for some time, started uh, doing some white background shots, like as my main uh, content. Uh, now I just... Uh, either delete, de- deleted or um, archi- archived those shots. But uh, but yeah, I actually did those. And my most liked picture is actually a white background one that I did with like Spidey figs. It's, it's, just, it's just the nature of people. If we were on DeviantArt or I don't know if CG Society is even around still. I've been there in a long time. You know, if we were on a, on a um, photography focused website or a digital art focused website, the engagement you receive would probably be much higher, but I'm staying on Instagram because this is where the community is. These are where my people are, where the brands are. People like my stuff. That's great. They see it and they don't like it, whatever. It, it can, it can crush somebody who's really trying hard to do something new. Uh, I've seen people quit Instagram because of it. Like their whole content has changed to like video game stuff or Poking on Snap or whatever, or Pokemon Go, excuse me, because they weren't getting the the likes. Fuck the likes. That's the T-shirt. Fuck the likes. It, it it doesn't validate your existence. Everyone wants a pat on the back saying, "Yeah, you did a good job." But if the people you care about are tuning in and constantly coming back in and saying, "Yo, this is dope," that's all that really matters. Just make sure you return the favor. If you're just sitting back, post thinking, "I'll post it and they will come," that ain't gonna happen. You got to put in the work. You, know, you have to network and meet people and engage people and stuff. But overall, yeah, don't don't get don't become um, addicted to the 
the metrics. Just make sure you're enjoying what you're doing. That's all I gotta say about that. If I may add uh, something, well, it's like uh, Brett, what you said. It's obvious that the content we do isn't meant for a platform like Instagram that doesn't even value pictures as it used to. So honestly, on my side, if I am still uh, on this platform, is just like uh, just the reason you you are. It's the community, honestly, like. Compared to back in 2018, where it, where when uh, when I really used to get a, a lot of likes for my content, and now I would consider myself happier now with like feedbacks from you three guys on a shot uh, compared to like a thousand uh, before. So I'm I'm very glad I I got to detach myself from. Uh, all those indicator like likes and comments on which I used to like, I used to judge my content based on those, those stuff. And it wasn't healthy because it didn't mean like shit. If I, if I may say that because, um, because like you said, e even back then, uh, the type of content we do wasn't even the thing that used to work the most. Like you just put a fig, on a white background and that would do like thousand likes compared to a more complex post that people didn't enjoy as much. So, so yeah, honestly, the, the community side and uh, getting to talk with all of you guys has been so much fun lately, like compared to having likes, like I totally trade all the likes for, uh, for this even back then. So, says the guy with 13.2 thousand followers. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> I'm just, I'm just messing I, with you, man. <laughs> I'm just messing yeah, with that's, you. But if I, like, you know, I, tr I turned my likes off for my pictures because I didn't even bother looking at them. But if I do show them to you, I will send you messages of the, of the likes I do on my posts. And it's ridiculous. Like, it's so low compared to my follower account, like my, technically my account currently is like dead. I wouldn't even like at some point when like the, the live drop started, I considered like changing my account, like creating a brand new one because I thought I was shadow banned or something, but in the end I just didn't bother. And, uh, unless you're posting like every single day and yeah, I don't have the, the bandwidth, the energy, or the motivation to post every single day because I won't be able to maintain the level of quality. Same. Uh, but then, you know, once in a while, there'll be a post out there that will um, take off. But more often than not, I've noticed it's, it's the simple things that are easy to understand. FSB just posted yesterday. He One of his... Um, and he keeps the same format. For some reason, one of his posts just hit uh, 50,000 likes and a million accounts reached. That's insane. The one after that, 450 likes. <laughs> it's it's really a gamble. That's why, that's why I'm like, you can't get hung up on trying to figure out the logic behind this or you'll go insane. It's just actually, yeah, the, I, I believe that's what the, the algorithm does. It's that it's, it doesn't show off a precise account on your pages, but a singular content. And it's not consistent. Like it means that, you know, some people have like one video with thousand likes and all the rest is like just a few, like 20, 50 likes. And I believe that Instagram's algori alg algorithm is um, getting closer to that type of thing. Where you know it's like singular content that's uh, showed on your explore page very randomly, so that is also a big issue because you cannot grow your account the way you could. Yeah, if you're if you're someone trying to be an influencer and pay bills with this shit, good good luck, man. Yeah, but this is this is not um, this isn't a hustle for me. I can only put so much effort in. I it, think I could never either. Like making it a job, it would be, I don't think like making something that you love become a job for you is, is something ideal. 
Well, as Zach said, you got to turn your hobbies into jobbies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I enjoy my job a lot. And it's in this, it's not in this field in particular. In fact, I started doing this because my job is a little more business clinical oriented, not as creative. I know I've done a couple of promo posts for some brands. I know Marcus has done as well. And I've been very lucky. It was a very simple process. Marcus, I'm, you want, I don't know if you want to talk to it for a moment. You don't have to name names, but you know, I know you've had some difficulties dealing with picky customers. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so regarding the algorithm thing, I would just like to say for me, I still get, you know, um, the the excitement of having, you know, likes, comments, shares. If you really focus on that, you you probably will end up, you know, quitting the hobby. And so for me, I always try, I always focus on my the work rather than the results of the, the, the perceptions of people. So yeah, just do whatever, man. And um, regarding promo work, um, I've, I've had customers that, you know, when I provide them the shots and when they post it, they would, you know, add their own filters or they'll change, you know, they will go into Lightroom and do some changes in which I wasn't very, you know, pleased with. And I have people that tell me that I want a certain specific styles that I want you to shoot. Um, for me, if you come to me and you want me to do a promo for you, then it's obviously, it's obvious that you like my work. But if you want me to do something that is not my style or what I usually do, then you, it's better for you to, you know, find someone else that do the things that you need. Right. So I have, a, you know, run into people like that. So, yeah, that's unfortunate. All right. So let's end on a positive note. I'd like to take a moment. If you guys have any particular accounts that you feel don't get the exposure that they deserve, I like to highlight some of those artists or those Instagram accounts, which I'll then link to all their accounts in the show notes. Marcus, I'll start with you. I would like to name Nikki Son Son. Uh, Nikki underline Sun Sun. Um, it, it's a she, and I think she has a variety of styles on her page. So, and I think she does great light work and great editing, but she doesn't have the, uh, the exposure. I, I don't know why, but you know, um, if you guys want to Star Wars content, um, anime content, then you can check out Nikki underline Sun Sun. S U N S U N. Yeah. I uh, I I followed her for a while. She hasn't posted since May. Yeah, hmm. cause um she, um I I think she's busy with work. Um because she's Chinese, she's in WeChat. So I you yeah. know I see well, her. Let her know we gave from... her let her know we gave her a shout out. Yeah, okay. No problem. Yeah. Uh, okay, Sam, did you have anybody you want to recommend? I'm looking at my following list uh, to find names. But there's this guy that does uh, recreations the way I I do. Like, he strictly only does that. And he, I think he uses, like, a fisheye lens for his pictures. And it gives them a pretty singular style. His name is Will Power Bricks. Red. I will send you one of his pics. It's it's honestly like like I said, it's like basic recreations, but I kinda enjoy his content lately. Well, like especially well, his, can, his can we get a name? Can you send me a link or something? Yeah. I just sent like a post to you. Uh willpower bricks. Willpower underscore bricks. I discovered his account like very recently with those two shots that I send you. And I, I thought they were they were great. Those Spider Verse one. That yeah, did. no, I mean are these they look like renders. So exactly, this is interesting. Are we sure these aren't renders? 
They no, they're not renderings. He actually no, you know what? Okay. So the picture you sent me is of um from Spider Verse where um he has, you know, Peter B and Miles are waiting to break into the lab and they're kinda of like thinking and holding their hand to their chin. And this dude went and literally I bet you if I took some time I could look at it further and figure it out. But he put the reflection of the forest on the heads as part of the glare. It's of the yeah, forest. that was like I was I was so amazed by it. That is very clever. And then yeah. the only thing that's not clever, well, I'm not saying it's not clever. I can see right away only because I, I have an eye for this stuff. He used the exact same reflection on both figs. He did a oh. minor warp. I I, so I did not even notice. But you know, it's not it's not bad. It's not a bad thing. It's just, I yeah. didn't notice it's a repeat. I can I can see the repeated shape really easily. But that's really clever. So that's why I thought it was a render because I saw this this volumetric lighting that was. Ref- that was the way it was reflecting the environment. That's pretty dope. This uh, Miles one's really good too. Yeah. So yeah, I, like that's a, an account I discovered like very recently, and I was pretty amazed by his content. And he posts very often, like I believe, uh, almost every day, like almost only two hundred posts. Yeah, he's, oh, this guy uh, gets his exposure. He's got eight thousand followers. Oh. I I actually just no, noticed that as well. I didn't know he had so many followers. <laughs> yeah, um, he's got double me. Um, oh, I like his spot one he just did. I think he's a sharpie. Oh, some good stuff. There's some there's some real creative stuff. Yeah, in there. yeah, some cool stuff. I'm gonna poke around on this guy's account. Okay. Sure. Okay, so I guess my turn. Um, I'm going to nominate three people. Um, for different reasons. T squared. T squared X, uh, X10. That is um, Thornton. He is an amazing editor. He doesn't post too often anymore. Um, just, he's just a matter of time. It takes him a while to do things. He often sometimes um, reposts older things with tweaks. He recently did a Justice League, a Snyder Cut scene. That is just phenomenal. Shout out to T, man. <laughs> uh, his Iron Giant was really good. I think his Flash one was the one that got him a lot of um, exposure. Yeah. yeah. But he does a lot of fun stuff. He's done Scooby Doo. He's done Star Wars. He's done Super Friends. I mean, Futurama. He did a really good um, Superman one. It's like Superman coming out of the clouds, Eagle landing on the shoulder. And then for Halloween, he did a zombie Superman version with a vulture on the shoulder. A second one I'd like to nominate is JC. I never say these words out loud. JC Mimoso. Yeah, um, JC. Yeah, you know, JC Milo. Phenomenal storytelling. He does a lot of Conan the Barbarian type stuff. The lava you're seeing in this, in this underground cave, it's all practical lighting. And he shoots a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Mm-hmm. But this lava tunnel is all practical lighting, and it looks like something out of a movie. But he does a lot of a lot of um, barbarian type minifigure scenes. He's done a few knights uh, and medieval things. Uh, I really, I really like his storytelling. I feel so bad not mentioning those guys because now that we were talking about them, I just saw that they only had like a thousand followers, and I never saw that my like i never paid attention to it but man it's a crime having so well i'll make you feel better i'm going to share somebody who has thirty-six thousand followers so we talked about story we talked about editing uh insomnia underscore builds does phenomenal mock work his recent cyberpunk one is amazing it's like three people hooked up to vr in the future oh yeah insomnia yeah and it's one of those. He's one of those accounts that, like, I don't know who you're talking about, and then you see his work, you're like, oh, that guy. He's a good example of someone to look to for inspiration. Like, you know, how did how did he make this? But doing different textured floors and walls and wiring and floor and wall decor and forestry. I mean, so many of these things are so simple, but they're so cute and they're really good. And so, 
he did his own cyberpunk, um, a few cyberpunk things that light up. Mm-hmm. So yeah, those are three guys that I would I would recommend. That kind of wraps up this first episode on Master Series. This is probably going to run a little long, but I'm going to make it a single episode. Uh, I'm not going to do it a two parter. Uh, just one last thing. Speaking of mocks, I would like to credit um, Ransom Fern. I'll, I'll send you guys uh, one specific post of him that for me is genius. Is uh, wait, is his Hulk Buster Hulk Buster modification he did? Like, oh, the, is this the guy the that five... was on? Um, yeah. Oh, this guy's been all over the place. Yeah, and, Ransom and, Fern. And, and uh, and that's genius, man. Like no extra pieces. Like with the the build Lego, like he just humiliated Lego there. He he showed them, like, <laughs> this thing has been blowing didn't... up everywhere. Bricks and tips or tricks, whatever that account's called, both featured it. And so, for those who aren't familiar, Ransom underscore Fern F E R N. Uh, he did an alternate build of the Hulkbuster, the three hundred dollar Hulkbuster or five hundred dollar Hulkbuster um, kit with no extra parts. He did an alt build, which looks so much better. The legs look good. The chest area is redesigned. Everything looks in proportion, but it still stands up straight just fine. And it's not as, uh, I believe it's not as fragile in the middle at the waist area either. So, yeah, and this this build, um, Sam, I know people that have bought this Hulkbuster set only because of this alt build exists. I, I am tempted myself to... To get I it am just too. To make that. Then I've got invoices to pay for a big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's it's on my wish list. And uh, Adam, do you have any closing thoughts? No, it's just been a blast hearing you guys uh, talk about your methods and uh, how you approach things, and and kind of going over these pictures again, and mm-hmm. and uh, enjoying all the work that you guys do. It's been it's been a blast. I'm a huge fan of all of you guys' photography, the way you guys approach it. And just listening to you guys talk about your methodology has been pretty awesome. I appreciate you coming back. Uh, I knew you were, as soon as I got um, Sam on, I knew I had to bring you on since he does shoot so many of your figs. And I know you've always been really a big fan of his work and a big promoter of his work. So that'd be great to get you guys together. Yep. Oh, it was definitely fun. Finally hear uh, Sam. Now, like you said, I'm going to hear your voice every time I read your DMs now. (laughs) Yep. Yep. (laughs) Um, And then you got through a whole episode without me asking a question about a fig coming out. This is true. Oh, well, once we wrap up the episode, I got some questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this will be off the record. But all right. Well, that being said, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming on and sharing your knowledge. Again, I, I respect the, the challenges uh, that folks are facing listening to this episode that's mostly based on a visual medium. Uh, I will put some supplemental materials in the additional slides on the Instagram post. I want to personally extend an invitation to anybody if they have a question about tips or tricks or techniques, please feel free to shoot me a DM. I'll do my best to answer it. If I don't know the answer, I probably know someone who does, and I will send you their way. Uh, Marcus, Sam, I imagine the same goes for you guys. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No problem. Obviously. Yeah. yeah, there's the community is the custom community is small. The, the photography side is even smaller. So, we do look out for each other. We are all connected. So also, don't real quick, don't limit yourself to just Lego photography. There's a large swath of action figure photographers that are amazing. And um, I wouldn't even mind getting one of them on here at one point to talk about what challenges they face. Because that's where I go to a lot of times for inspiration. And granted, I'm also a little jealous because they've got, you know, a lot more flexibility with poses and whatnot. Dioramas, they don't have to, they don't have to build their sets. <laughs> they can just buy a buy a brick wall in the future i also i do plan on live streaming my editing and techniques or maybe uh sir dork does a great job of breaking down people's action figure photography on youtube maybe that's something i should look into at some point so i love sharing this knowledge i used to teach it i kind of miss teaching it and uh i guess that's all i got so uh, amazing you got to do that well, yeah, I have so much time in a day. I've got my career, know, right? I've got my family, I've got the podcast, I've got the Geek Exchange, and then I, at some point I want to still take pictures. <laughs> so, um, but all right, so wrapping up, uh, this podcast is written, produced, and paid for by yours truly. If you wish to show your support, there will be links in the show notes and my Instagram bio to buy me some coffee 
And uh, also my print shop, we can buy prints of my work that you, that you may like. Every dollar earned goes back to paying into the services and equipment used for this podcast. Um, as always, you're never obligated, but it's always appreciated. Until next time, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and we'll see you next episode. Everyone say bye. 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 <laughs> I want you on my rack I want to make you ring I want you to unwrap I want to pull your string Bring me the next shiny new